This is Lesson 27.3, Mussolini and Fascism in Italy. So what kind of government did Mussolini establish in Italy? We're still with College Board Topic 8.6, Fascism and Totalitarianism. The ideology of fascism with its roots in the pre-World War I era gained popularity in an environment of post-war bitterness, the rise of communism, uncertain transitions to democracy, and economic instability. Fascist dictators used modern technology and propaganda that rejected democratic institutions, promoted charismatic leaders, and glorified war and nationalism to attract the disillusioned. And Mussolini and Hitler rose to power by exploiting post-war bitterness and economic instability, using terror, and manipulating the fledgling and unpopular democracies in their countries. And after failures to establish functioning democracies, authoritarian dictatorships took power in Central and Eastern Europe during the interwar period. The place, Italy, 1914 to 1938. Key people and concepts of Mussolini and fascism in Italy. Fascism. Fasces. Benito Mussolini, the Black Shirts, and the Lateran Agreement or Lateran Accords. Intro. Benito Mussolini's movement was the first to use the term fascist. Mussolini created a totalitarian regime based upon nationalism and militarism. Italy before World War I. At the beginning of the 20th century, Italy was a constitutional monarchy. There was even universal male suffrage at the beginning of the war. But there were also challenges for Italy. Italy was still a relatively new nation. Many people still identified more with their regions than with their nation. Many were opposed to liberal institutions, conservatives, devout Catholics, and landowners. There were huge gaps between the wealthy and the poor. The Catholic Church in Rome had been opposed to the Italian nation since its beginning. Like Germany, Italy had a large and powerful socialist party. They had lots of seats in the Italian parliament. They didn't hold a majority. They weren't part of a governing coalition. But they were increasingly brazen about what they were willing to do to gain power in terms of disruption and intimidation. Benito Mussolini. Mussolini became a prominent socialist leader. He was born in 1883. He came from modest means as a child. He never forgot the resentment he felt watching the rich kids at his boarding school get preferential treatment. He had a violent and mischievous nature, but he loved to read. He read lots of books about politics and current events. His dad had been an outspoken socialist. Mussolini's early career. Mussolini made it through college and got a teaching certificate. He was soon told that teaching was not for him and he was let go. He began working as a bricklayer and he became active in the local union. Unions tend to be hotbeds of leftist ideology. They preached anger at the government. They preached contempt for the church. They were militant on behalf of workers' rights. Mussolini worked hard to cultivate his talents as a showman. Charisma and spectacle were two things that Mussolini was really good at. For example, he was very conscientious about his dress and grooming in private. But before making his speech, he would deliberately not shave and not comb his hair to look the part of the wild radical. He would rehearse his speeches to make them seem as spontaneous and as extemporaneous as possible. It was around this time that Mussolini began to see himself as a man of destiny. And this was, as we remember, what had motivated Napoleon. If destiny's on your side, you don't have to worry about making any catastrophic mistakes. You don't have to take advice from other people. You just have to listen to the voice in your head. And that voice will always be right because it's your destiny. Mussolini started to develop a following as a political writer and editor. For example, he wrote a popular magazine serial about a lecherous, perverted cardinal that was called the Cardinal's Mistress. As a socialist, Mussolini sounded more like a Marxist in his speeches to union workers. He would say things like, The elite classes would never relinquish their privileges without a fight. The Italian parliament would never take their side against the bourgeoisie. Religion 
and patriotism were false and should be abandoned. Justice came only through violent struggle, and revolution was essential. But then, in 1914, Mussolini did such a total 180 that he was literally kicked out of the Italian Socialist Party. World War I had come to Europe, though not yet to Italy. Socialists wanted absolutely nothing to do with the war. But Mussolini founded a newspaper called Il Popolo d'Italia and urged Italy to enter the war. Mussolini could never be a pacifist like his socialist colleagues were. He may also have been bought off by powerful forces who wanted Italy to join the war. French business interests promised to reward Mussolini for promoting Italy's entry into the war. Weapons manufacturers also financed Mussolini's newspaper. When Italy joined the war in 1915, Mussolini didn't mind being drafted. He served honorably for 17 months. He missed being in the disastrous Battle of Caporetto in October 1917. He was recovering from severe injuries received during a training exercise. As we know, 10,000 Italian soldiers were killed, 30,000 were injured, and over 250,000 were captured. Italy was on the winning side of the war, but gained almost nothing from the victory. Italy received none of the territory that had been promised to it. Italy's king, Victor Emmanuel III, wasn't even invited to the Versailles Peace Conference. And as a result, the Italian Socialist Party became bigger and stronger than ever. They had been against Italy joining the war from the beginning. And now they were the only ones who could say, I told you so. As a powerful, though not governing, party, you have two choices. You can try to legislate the things you want, or you can go out and take physical action to force the things you want. The Italian Socialist Party chose the latter. They literally hired gunmen to go to the factory strikes and intimidate those who wanted to break the strike in order to work. Sometimes they even took factories over completely. They took control over numerous local municipal governments. Socialist peasants in the country started claiming the land that they had been working as their own. All of this was very alarming to the conservatives. There was no middle ground upon which to reach a compromise with the socialists. The Italian economy suffered greatly from all the disruption. Prices rose, food shortages grew, basic government services broke down, trains ran days or even weeks late. Thousands of army veterans returned home from the war to be confronted by hecklers and no job. Parliament was regarded as totally corrupt and ineffective at governing. The king, Victor Emmanuel III, was timid and indecisive. And all of this was the perfect storm for a charismatic showman to show up. The fascist party was formed on March 23, 1919, by a few dozen men in a Milan business meeting hall. They pledged their readiness to kill or die to protect Italy against all enemies. Their chosen symbol was the fascio, or fasces in English, and this was a bundle of elm rods coupled with an axe. The fascio was the perfect symbol for fascism on multiple levels. It was Roman. It had been the symbol for the power of an ancient Roman consul. So inherent in the symbol was the idea of history and Romanness, and it's got a sharp weapon attached to it. Its construction said what they wanted to say about their party. You could think of each rod as representing a different segment of Italian society that had bought into the party. Workers, students, soldiers, business people. All Italian, all supporting each other and looking out for each other. And excluding anything or anyone that didn't qualify as Roman. Within two years, the party had 2,000 chapters. Their leader was Mussolini, and it grew for two reasons. Number one, millions of Italians hated the disruptions they were seeing in their country. And number two, they were also very afraid of what was happening in Bolshevik Russia. Mussolini's message. Reject the capitalists who want to exploit you. Reject the socialists who want to disrupt your lives. 
Reject the crooked and spineless politicians who do nothing but talk while the country goes in decline. Italians should unite on a common front against those who had been holding Italy back. The foreign, the weak, the politically unreliable. Believe in an Italy that would be prosperous because it would be self-sufficient and believe in an Italy that would be respected because it would be feared. Mussolini's primary target was his old party, the Socialists. The Socialists still enjoyed the most favorable political status in Italy. Mussolini had a huge number of jobless veterans whom he organized into squads of armed men called Fasci di Combattimento. They shot labor leaders. They trashed newspaper offices. They beat up workers and peasants. Many in the police viewed the black shirts sympathetically. As long as these squads were inflicting damage to socialists, the police would look the other way. With the Fasci di Combattimento, Mussolini was driving the socialists out of cities and towns all over Italy. They wore distinctive makeshift uniforms. For example, if you couldn't afford to buy a black shirt, you dyed one you already had. Hence their nickname, the black shirts. The socialists had the black shirts outnumbered and they were accustomed to being violent. So the black shirts gradually gained the upper hand through willingness to be even more violent and ruthless. As the first fascist leader, Mussolini had no previous playbook to work from. He was winging it. So their direction was undefined at this point. They had lots and lots of goals, but the movement was like a bunch of independent planks without a platform. There was no single manifesto. Some of these goals were socialist in nature. Others were more nationalist in nature. So the movement meant different things to different people. For some, it was a way to rescue capitalism and the Catholic Church from the Leninist hordes. For others, it meant defending tradition and the monarchy. For others, it was a chance to bring glory back to Italy. For some, it meant a paycheck. For some, it meant a sanction to get violent and beat people up. Mussolini himself was more pragmatic than ideological. He accepted money from big corporations and banks. At the same time, he also spoke the language of veterans and workers. He even tried hard to reconcile with his former socialist colleagues, but the socialists weren't having it, and his more extreme fascist followers were angry that he even tried. As the political environment got worse in Italy, Mussolini had to become ever more militant in order to keep pace with the growing militancy of the people he was supposedly leading. So in some ways, the tale of violent right-wing militancy was wagging the dog. And this situation led to the March on Rome. The March on Rome, October 1922. Mussolini decided it was time to challenge the government directly. He mobilized fascists from around Italy. He made a speech in Milan at the party conference in which he said, either we are allowed to govern or we will seize power by marching on Rome. King Victor Emmanuel III was really the only person in a position to stop Mussolini's fascists. The politics in Italy had become polarized between two extremes, the fascists and the socialists. Political moderates were divided and politically weak. Because the middle ground had collapsed, the king had to choose between the socialists who wanted to end the monarchy and the fascists who might be willing to work with him. The army and the prime minister advised King Victor Emmanuel III to block the march, arrest Mussolini, and deal with the socialists later. And at first, the king did nothing to stop this march on Rome. Then, the fascists started to occupy media sites and government buildings. So at 2 a.m. on October the 28th, the king ordered that the fascists be stopped. But then, at 9 a.m., just hours later, he reversed himself and told the army to stand down. The king had convinced himself that the fascists could defeat his army, which they could not have if the king had just stayed the course. 
With tens of thousands of black shirts marching on Rome unopposed, the king cabled Mussolini in Milan and asked him to be the new prime minister of Italy. The current prime minister had lost his majority in the Italian parliament, so there was a legal avenue available to replace him. Mussolini had become prime minister of Italy over the course of a weekend. He did it without winning an election, but he also did it without technically violating the Constitution. Another march on Rome took place on October the 31st, but this march was more of a celebratory parade than it was a coup. The march included people with makeshift weapons from all walks of life. Fishermen, clerks, shopkeepers, farmers, even about 200 Jewish people. Two weeks later, Mussolini made his first address to the still socialist-dominated Italian legislature. And he began his speech by striding into the hall and giving the Roman salute. And this was a good example of Mussolini's talent for theater and showmanship. European artists had attributed this salute to classical Rome in the neoclassical artistic period that we studied. Mussolini's fascists formally adopted it in 1923. But American school children did the exact same salute when reciting the Pledge of Allegiance from the 1890s all the way up to World War II. No one associated with Nazism because there were no Nazis yet. It was phased out and replaced with holding the hand over the heart after Hitler started using that salute. Mussolini had intimidating security guards sitting around the edge of the chamber, fondling daggers the entire time. And Mussolini warned Parliament that he could have bivouacked all his troops right there in the Parliament chamber and barred Parliament. And the only reason he had not was because he had not wished to. And he told them that he could dissolve Parliament anytime he wanted. Once in power, Mussolini actually found that he enjoyed providing good government. Most authoritarians enjoy the power, but not the governing. They don't really care about serving the people. The people are supposed to serve them. However, Mussolini saw good government as a path to popularity. The people had been deprived of good government for so long, and he wouldn't really have to work that hard because the only direction he could go was up. Examples of Mussolini's government reform. Daily roll calls in ministry offices and berating employees who arrived late or took long lunches. He also fired more than 35,000 civil servants. And he repurposed fascist gangs to protect rail cargo from thieves. He didn't quite get the trains to run on time, but they were a lot better. He allocated money for essential infrastructure, such as bridges, roads, telephone exchanges, and aqueducts. He gave Italy an eight-hour workday. He codified insurance benefits for the elderly and the disabled. He funded prenatal health care clinics. He established 1,700 summer camps for children. And he went after the mafia by suspending the jury system and thereby depriving the mafia of juries that they could threaten and intimidate. However, Mussolini's desire for good governing also fed his desire for power. He felt it was necessary for him to rule absolutely. Men of destiny like Mussolini have complete trust in their own judgment and intuition. He insisted that his instincts were always right. He once said to a reporter, Often, I would like to be wrong, but so far it's never happened. He didn't want to hear any advice that might make him doubt himself. In April 1924, he got the Italian parliament to pass an election law that said that whatever political party got the most votes would get an automatic two-thirds of representatives. This reminds me a little of our own Senate's 60% supermajority filibuster rule. This rule put the fascist party in control of the parliament. When socialist leader Giacomo Mattioti produced evidence of vote rigging, he was kidnapped and murdered. And by the end of 1926, Il Duce, the boss as Mussolini was called, had eliminated all competing political parties and Italy was a one-party state. 
Mussolini abolished freedom of the press. He stripped the labor movement of any power. He secured the right to name municipal officials himself. He took control of the national police, but he also expanded it, and he also widened its duties to include internal surveillance. He controlled the monarchy by reserving the right to name any successor to the king. He turned schools into human factories of militant indoctrination. Kids recited the fascist credo, believe, obey, fight. Mussolini predicted that the new century would be marked by the people's thirst for authority, and he preached of a dominant Italy, which would become great with more spazio vitale, living space. Spazio vitale would have Italy dominating the entire Mediterranean. The pathway to spazio vitale was war, which he encouraged Italians to embrace. Through war, Mussolini reduced Albania to a protectorate. He then invaded one of Africa's last independent nations, Ethiopia, with machine guns and poison gas. To raise money, Italian women donated their wedding rings to be melted down into gold. Mussolini described the Ethiopian campaign as the greatest colonial war in all history. Ethiopia was forced to surrender. The League of Nations imposed economic sanctions on Mussolini for attacking Ethiopia, which he really resented. His attitude was, why should all these imperial powers criticize me for doing what they've already done to the entire rest of Africa? Why did they have the right to do that and I don't? Mussolini was convinced that the crowd always wanted a show. He compared his control over the crowd to women who were helpless in the presence of strong men. He posed in the state-controlled media shirtless and on his white stallion. Wonder where Putin gets it? Mussolini attended countless weddings, factory openings, and patriotic events. When giving speeches, he stood on a small platform to look taller. He was five foot six inches. His image was used to endorse countless consumer goods like hair tonic and baby food and lingerie and pasta. Mussolini and Compromise In addition to being a talented showman, Mussolini was also a competent internal deal maker. He reached compromises with the elites of Italy who controlled the army, the economy, and the state. He completed the Lateran Agreement, also known as the Lateran Accords, also known as the Lateran Treaty of 1929, with the Catholic Church. He gave the Catholic Church recognition as an independent state, and he agreed to give the Church financial support, including bigger salaries for priests. But he also got to appoint bishops. Because of these compromises, Mussolini was never able to establish complete totalitarian control. Mussolini's shortcomings. He had a poor understanding of economic issues such as interest rates and currency. His expectation that he could make Italy economically self-sufficient was totally unrealistic. He promised the Italian people all things, but Italy lacked the resources. Mussolini was also a poor diplomat and judge of individual character. In 1937, Mussolini visited Berlin. And he was so impressed with Hitler that he pledged his support and promised that Italy and Germany would march together right to the end. In 1938, he even passed a series of unpopular anti-Jewish racial laws. Jewish students were forced out of public schools. Jewish people were dismissed from professional careers. But absolute brutality against the Jewish people didn't occur until the Nazis took over northern Italy late in World War II.